Well, good morning once again, Northland. I just had a moment just over there as we were singing Jaira, and then Danny was praying, and uh, my oldest just put his arm around me, and I'm like losing it up here, uh, because it just, yeah, it just was one of those moments where you're like, yeah, Jaira, you, you're, you're, you're enough. Like, I need a tissue, so sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, Caleb, I love you. Thank you for putting your arm around, around your dad. And sometimes I, you know, I wonder, you, you wonder if you have teenagers, do, do your teenagers love you? <laughs> do they even acknowledge you? And so, oh my gosh, wow. All right, so I'm losing it up here, but we're starting a brand new series. Uh, oh, look at you, Christina. You are amazing. Thank you so much. Perfect. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so, uh, so perfect, perfect. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, guys, to be emotional. Um, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and turn with me to Ruth chapter one. Ruth chapter one. We're starting a brand new series this week entitled More Than Enough. Now, we're actually going to be focusing on a character that maybe when you hear the book of Ruth, you don't necessarily immediately go to her, but Naomi. Now, this past week when I was telling my wife who I was going to really be focusing on in this series. She's like, well, you've got to pronounce her name right. And because I kept on saying Naomi. And she's like, it's not Naomi, it's Naomi. I'm like, quit giving this Southerner such a hard time. In Tennessee, we call her Naomi. All right, Can, amen, amen. Some of you, yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of you from Alabama, I mean, you know, I don't know what you even call her. But anyways, in Tennessee. So, so Naomi, we're going to be focusing on Naomi because, oh my gosh, I, I, you know, I can't get ahead of myself, but our, our, our last message in this series, I'm going to go buck wild. I mean, I just like, yeah, that's Greek for I'm going to go buck wild because chapter four, I, I can't even wait to get there. But here's the storyline that we're going to follow in the book of Ruth. I'm going to put it up here on the screen uh, because again, we're, we're going to be talking about believers, Christians. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're not a Christian, I'm going to invite you you to kind of pay attention in this series because I want you to understand that God is all that you need. But, but here's the storyline that we're going to follow for believers, for those who follow Jesus. There's going to be times where we might be tempted to believe that God isn't enough. And what you're going to do is you're going to figure, you're going to, you're going to figure out in your own way, well, you know what? I know better than God. So there's going to be times in your life where we're tempted to believe that God isn't enough. And as a result, we're going to say, God, we know better than you. But here's what's going to happen. My life is going to become bitter, not better. Because if you are a child of the king and you, and you start running around or running away from him trying to find and, and fill your desires and your satisfactions without looking to him, I promise your life is going to end up being more bitter than better. We'll see that this morning. And then, but God's going to meet you in your bitterness and he's going to work and wink, but you're not going to see him. And what I mean by wink, he's gonna be subtly pursuing you, showing you that he's better. That, that he's working in your life for good, but, but you're, not, you're gonna miss them because you're still in your bitterness, but then you're gonna come to a realization that God is enough. And this is where I can't wait. Oh, I just can't wait, chapter four. is when you and I get to the point, even as believers, when we realize that God is enough, you'll come to realize that he's more than enough. So that, that's the story arc of Ruth, and I, I just, I'm just so excited about it. So here's the three things that I want you to really learn, pay attention throughout this series, and here they are. The, the first one is that I want you to, here we go, we're going to go to the next slide, boom, all right, here we go. Uh, learn to trust the Lord in every season. Like if you are a child of the king in every season, even in your barren dry wilderness seasons. Learn to trust the Lord. Train your eyes to see God's goodness and because there's gonna be times where we are tempted to, to not see that he's still good and that he's working good, but we, we, that's why we gotta train our eyes to see and then we gotta realize that the Lord is enough. He's all that you need. Now, as I was looking at how I wanted to kind of structure this kind of introduction, particularly around the, the theme more than enough, I actually Googled this phrase. 
what's something you cannot get enough of? What's something that you cannot get enough of? And so I'm just gonna share some of the, the results with you this morning. So here's one thing that you can't get enough of, peace and quiet, moms. Can I get an amen? Like you, you try to get the peace and quiet, but man, they, they follow you in the bathroom. You're like, can I just, anyway, sorry, we'll, we'll move on. The second thing is happy, happiness. Like you, you just can't get enough of happiness, like just happiness in your life because when you are happy, you wanna dance and you wanna smile. And then the, the third thing that you, you can't get enough of is exercise. Like there's just some of you, you know, and here's the thing about me, like I can't get enough of exercise. And the reason why I can't get enough of exercise is because I kind of have this, at least this math in my head. If I eat this many calories, I've got to exercise this amount. And like, I just can't get enough of exercise. Here's another thing you can't get enough of. It's just knowledge, knowledge. There's just a lot of you, you're like, man, I wish I was smarter. Wish I was brighter. I wish I knew more than I was, you know, I, like I just can't get enough of, of knowledge. Here's, here's another thing we can't get enough of, appreciation. Like, just thank you, thank you very much. Like, you, you just wish that your spouse would just recognize you. you. You wish that your spouse would say, you know what, babe, I really appreciate how you fold all the clothes all the time. You know, or, you, you know, hey, your boss, I really appreciate you. Man, you, you really do work hard. Like, we just cannot get enough of that. And another thing that we can't get enough of is money. Like, you're like, man, I wish I had more money. Wish I had more money. Can't get enough of money. Another thing that we can't get enough of is time. Some of you are like, man, I wish, I, I wish I could get more time to do X, Y, Z. Another thing that we would say we can't get enough of is laughter. Some of you, you need to laugh more. Can I just say that? Some of you take yourself way too seriously. You take life way too seriously. Did you know that you burn more calories laughing than you do frowning? That's a workout in and of itself. I remember a couple weeks ago, we were on staff retreat. We came back and we were asking everybody who went, hey, how, how was it? And, you know, a little feedback. And they're like, we haven't laughed that much in years. And I'm like, that's awesome. Because I want us to laugh. Like laughter, you can't get enough of laughter. All right, here, here's another thing. Uh, food. Some of you just can't get enough of food. You love, 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 love your food. And then last but not least, you can't get enough of sleep. You just wish you could get more sleep. And, and so maybe there's some truth to the fact that we can't get enough of these things or, or at least maybe seasons that we go through that we wish we could get more of that. But I want us to know throughout this series that God is enough. And so here's the main point that we're gonna flesh out this morning is even when we go through a bitter season and maybe some of you, you are in a bitter season right now. We must cling to the truth that we have a better savior. If you're in a bitter season, realize and cling to the truth. You have a better savior. So with that, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word, Ruth chapter one, Ruth chapter one. We don't know who wrote the book of Ruth. Some people think Samuel, maybe even some people think David. We don't know. But Ruth is one of the two books of the Bible in the Old Testament named after a woman. The second is Esther. So Ruth, though, one of her distinguishing marks is also that she is a Gentile. She is a Moabite. And so in the days when the judges ruled, that gives you the time period of when the book of Ruth was written, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and Elimelech, his name means God is king, or my God is king. His wife's name was Naomi, which means pleasantness, and the names of his two sons were Malon, which literally means sick. So could you imagine, hey, what do you want to name him? Man, what a beautiful baby, what do you want to name him? Sick. And Kilion, so those names kind of remind me of Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit. So you got Malon, but Kilion means wasting away. So I don't think Jimmy Buffett was around at that point, wasting away in Margaritaville. That's like wasting away, tired. So you got sick and tired. That's the name of their children. So <laughs> uh, they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem. And Bethlehem actually means house of bread. So there's no bread in the house of bread. And they went to Moab and lived there. The author continues on. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons, sick and wasting away. 
They married Moabite women and one named Orpah, which means gazelle, mane or neck. So in Dallas, she had beautiful hair. She had legs like a gazelle, a beautiful neck. We don't, we don't know, but that's what her name means. And the other, Ruth, and her name means friend or friendship. And that's going to be important later on. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. And Naomi was left with her two sons uh, and her husband, without, without her two sons and the husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. So I got to go back home. Well, then we read... With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, hey, I need you to go back to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant to each of you that will, will, will find rest in the home of another husband. And so she kisses them and says goodbye and they weep aloud and said to her, so in this hallmark moment, here's what they say. We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, no, my daughters return home. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? Like uh, who could become your husbands? Like return home. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me and I found the man of my dreams and, and we gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? No, no, we're, we're, you, we're, no, don't do that, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. Let's pray. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here engaging with us online. Maybe they will find themselves identifying with Naomi, just a bitter season. Maybe they'll find themselves identifying with Elimelech or Ruth. I do pray, Spirit of God, that you would move, that you would open up all of our eyes to see, that you would open up our ears to hear, our mind to understand and our heart to receive, that we truly do cling to a better Savior. And it's in your name we pray. All God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. All right. So we're going to look at two truths. So no, no three points, four points, no, just two, but they're, but they're deep. And we're going to unpack them. So two truths uh, that will flesh out this main point. So the first one is this, running away from God will make your life more bitter, not better. And again, I'm talking to Christians. Now, why would I not be talking to non-Christians about this? Because I'm not going to sit here and say, if you, because here's the thing, you're already away from the Lord. You're running away from the Lord. I want you to know he's pursuing you. He loves you too much and he, he wants you to come to know him. But here's the thing that I also know based upon the scriptures is that the God of this world, Satan, has blinded your mind to prevent you from seeing the goodness of God. So there might be times where your life may not even get bitter and you're already running away from God because Satan has blinded you from seeing your sin and God's goodness. So, but I'm, I'm talking to believers that if you run away from God, your life, my life will become more bitter, not better. So what we read here is that there is a famine in the land. Now, do we know why there is a famine in the land? Is it just a coincidence? Is it just because of the cycle? Uh, is it just bad luck? No, it's not. Let's read Leviticus 26. So Leviticus was written during the wilderness wanderings before Israel went into the promised land and conquered it. And so God is giving them these, these bouts of understanding that, hey, if you obey me, then you're going to enjoy long life in the land. You're going to experience fruitfulness and flourishing in the land. But then he's going to give them curses if they disobey. And this is one of those portions. And the Lord says, if after all of this, you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sin seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of your land yield their fruit. So when you read the book of Judges, you actually see there's this cycle that Israel is doing what is right in their own eyes. 
And God would meet them in their stubbornness and in their sinfulness with curses and punishments. So sometimes he would raise up enemies, send them in. Sometimes there would be famines and then they would come back to the Lord and they would, they would begin to obey him. And then a couple years later, once again, they enter into this cycle of disobedience. God sends pestilence or famine or enemies, and then they come back. And so what we see in Ruth is a snapshot of one of those dry, barren seasons where God is disciplining his people. But I, I want us to realize that God has already told them before they even got into the promised land, listen, if you obey me, you will enjoy long life in the land. If you obey me, I will give you rest from my enemies. If you obey me, there will, be, there will be milk and honey in abundance if you just obey me. But if you don't, I will discipline you because I love you. And I will discipline not only because I love you, but because this purpose I have for you is to mediate between me and the surrounding nations. But if you're acting just like all of the other nations, you cannot mediate between me and them. So I'm going to discipline you. So that's what's happening. God is disciplining Israel and with the hopes that they will be restored and that they will become once again obedient to him. But at least at this point, there's this famine. And so he's hoping that they will come back to him. Now, let me say this. For any famine, for any kind of reason, we as the people of God should not be driven away from God, but back to God. So any kind of famine that happens in our life, it should not prompt us to run away from the Lord, but to run back to him. Now, we talked about how we should process pain and suffering weeks ago in our series, Iron Faith. And we talked about how God uses disappointments, dissatisfactions, uh, difficulties, discomfort, despair, death, and yes, even discipline when we become wayward to mold and shape us more into the image of Jesus, to forge a deeper faith in us, and to strengthen the resolve of our salvation. Now, what's interesting here in the book of Ruth is Elimelech decides the famine is just too much for him and his family. And so rather than staying in the promised land, being part of God's discipline on his people, taking part of the ownership of the disobedience of God's people, here's what Elimelech decides to do. You know what, I'm just, hey, hey Naomi, let's just turn our house into an Airbnb. We'll, we'll put it online. It will, we'll, obviously, we'll have to tell people it's a famine in the land, but we'll, we'll, we'll severely discount our house. And, and we'll just load up and we'll go to Moab for a season. Now, here's what you need to know in that context too. And we see it in the last verse of the book of Judges. Here's what we read. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. So, so Elimelech is taking matters into his own hands and doing what he saw fit. Now, we're sitting here in the 21st century and we're like, well, we, no, we, no one would blame Elimelech for that. Like, there's no bread in the house of bread. But you're, you're reading the news reports coming out of Moab. You, you, you're seeing some, some, some talk on Twitter that, hey, they got bread. We ain't got bread. We got the means to leave. Hey, let's leave the house of bread and actually go to Moab so that we can find bread. But he's doing what he thinks is right, not what the Lord tells him what is right. Because let me, let me, let me put up a map for you. Let me put up a map. So this was the promised land. Now, while I have this map up here, here's what I want us to do. I want us to pray for what's going over there in this part of the world. So will you pause with me and we, we're gonna pray for what's going on over there. So Father, we just pray for what is happening in the Middle East. And we pray for a quick resolve there among the people of Israel. We pray for the peace of Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Father, we also pray for protection and safety over the population, over women, children, and civilians in all of these areas. We also pray for the militants. We pray, Father, that their hearts would be softened, that their hatred would be diffused. 
Father, we pray for your glory in the midst of this tragedy. We pray for your glory in the midst of chaos. We pray for your order to be brought into this region. We also pray ultimately, we know that for many, many Jews, they are stubborn and they are hard hearted and they are blind to seeing from seeing Jesus as their Prince of Peace. And so we just pray that you would use this pain that they are experiencing, Father, to draw them, to open up their eyes to the Prince of Peace. We also pray for Muslims that they would come to know Isa, Jesus, that he is Lord, he is king. He's not just a prophet, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So Jesus, we pray that you would work and that you would work mightily in this conflict and this chaos so that you might get the glory at the end of the day. For it's in your name we pray, amen. So in this day, in Ruth, this is the promised land. I want you to understand that when God entered into a covenant with Israel at Sinai, part of that covenant included the land, the boundaries of the land. And you can read about the boundaries of the land. So God's protection, his provision, and his presence, they were centered around the land. So you had covenantal boundaries, not only covenantal spiritual boundaries of how they were to live, but actual covenantal geographical boundaries. Here's what Elimelech does. He's like, you know what? We have, we have wandered outside the spiritual boundaries of his covenant. God has brought discipline, but what we're going to do, Naomi, baby, we're going to take matters into our own hand and we're going to go outside the covenant in another layer and we're going to enter into enemy territory because they got bread. So they're going outside the covenantal boundaries in two ways, spiritually and geographically. God's promises were in the land. And so now he's going into enemy territory. Now, how does this apply to us today, Josh? Because the covenant that Jesus entered into with us, we don't have geographical boundaries. So what is our promised land? Well, I'm gonna give, give you another image. And so this image is Jesus is our promised land. All the promises of God are yes in Jesus. And so when, when you look at Jesus being our promised land, so that's why he had to die. So that, so that he could reconcile us to God so that we would be included and grafted into God and his kingdom. And so within the promised land, namely Jesus, we have the people of God, the church of God. We have the scriptures, the word of God that direct us, that, that give us guidance of how we ought to relate to others, how we ought to create and cultivate, how we are to operate and steward everything in our life. And then the spirit of God fills us so that we might operate in power in the promised land called Jesus. But there's times in our life as Christians where we are tempted to go outside of Jesus because yeah, there might be times where we, we don't have as much money as we want. We, we don't have as much love as, as we want. So instead of finding it in Jesus because he's all that we need, we're gonna go outside and we're gonna go to the world which is not our promised land and we're gonna start saying, hey, you know what? Money's going to provide. Money's the answer. And then we're gonna look, oh, you know what? Knowledge, knowledge is the answer. You know what? Relationship, my identity and my sexuality, my identity as a, you know, in my gender, you know, that, that's where it's found or, or just power. And here's the thing. When we do that, we do just what Elimelech did, take matters into our own hands and we go find satisfaction in all the wrong places. So how do Christians run away from the promise the protection, the provision of Christ. How do we go and search for enough outside of Jesus today? Well, I'm glad that you asked. Here we go. Well, we believe that there, there, there are believers. Now, again, I'm talking about believers. There are believers who think they know better biblically. That, you know what? They, they just don't even see the scriptures as authoritative anymore. I'm just gonna do whatever I want to do. 
Or they might see the scriptures as authoritative, but they'll manipulate the scriptures to say what they want them to say to accommodate their behavior and their lifestyle. As a way they go outside the boundaries of the covenant stipulations of Jesus. They just think they know better. They believe they know better sexually. You know, we know that the word tells us to remain pure and holy and that we should not be sexually active or promiscuous outside the covenant of marriage. But there, there, there are young people, there are even older people that aren't married that, you know what, I, I, I don't really care. I'm just gonna live outside the covenant stipulation. I'm not gonna be pure, not gonna be holy, not gonna treat my body as a temple because you know what, I know better, I got needs. We believe we know better relationally. You know, so when, when believers, when they date and they find somebody, oh man, they're just beautiful. They're just a fun person to be around. I know they don't know Jesus, but hey, listen, I, I'm just praying for their salvation. And then they'll, they'll, they'll move a step further and they'll go from dating to, you know what, well, we're getting married, you know, we're gonna get married, but I, I know that that, you know, I know that they don't know, know, know the Lord and we don't know where we would go to church, but, but, but I got, you know, I've just met the person of my dreams. You, do you know better than God? So you're gonna pursue something that God doesn't want you to pursue. Because here's the thing about Ruth. It's not that God is against interracial marriages. He's actually against unequally yoked marriages of a believer and an unbeliever. That's what he's against. Oh, I'm just gonna change him. No, they're gonna change you. You all right? Okay. Then you think you know better relationally by just withholding forgiveness and sitting in your bitterness, sitting in your anger, sitting in your resentment. And let me just even go a step further in this. Some of you, you're sitting in unforgiveness of yourself. You have not forgiven yourself. Listen, if Jesus has forgiven you, forgive yourself. Some of you, you think you know better marit maritally. Jesus is a part of your marriage, but he's not the center of your marriage. Let me tell you something. If Jesus isn't the center of your marriage, your marriage is still in trouble. Some of us, we, as, again, I'm talking to believers. Some of us, we believe we know better financially. I know God tells, tells, tells me to give. I know I'm supposed to tithe. But you, I, we got a lot of needs. I just can't afford to. No, you cannot afford not to tithe. Like, stop robbing God. Some of us, we believe that we know better intellectually and emotionally. Like, I need these things. I need these things to be happy. If you start centering your emotional happiness around stuff, you have gone outside the covenant of Jesus. Jesus is enough. Some of us, we, we think we know better corporately. You know, we'll just remain, and I know I'm speaking to the choir right here, but you know, we'll, we'll just remain isolated from the body. Or you know what? We're just not going to teach our children the importance of being part of a local church. And what we're seeing today Here's what we're seeing. We're seeing the church in North America be in a bitter season because they have not realized that Jesus is better. And so we're not teaching the next generation that, hey, Jesus is not only the most important thing, but also his body called the church, his bride should also be important. Yeah. 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 Hey, some of you be like, eh, well, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Well, you ain't gotta agree with the Bible. Probably part of the problem. So, so these are the ways that we go outside the covenantal boundaries looking. Again, we go outside of Jesus trying to find satisfaction, fulfillment. We try to find enough in all the wrong places when Jesus is saying, I'm enough. And um, what happens when you choose to live outside the covenantal boundaries? Well, we already see here that God sent a famine. So Israel, in a, in a habitual manner, is disobeying the Lord. He brings a famine. But I, I want us to now drill down on Elimelech and his family. Now, I, I'm not going to speculate. I don't want to speculate. I don't want to read into the text. But here's what I find extremely interesting. Let's put up the first verse. So Elimelech tells Naomi, no bread, 
and the house of bread, let's go to Moab. So when they went to Moab and lived there, the very next sentence, here's what we read. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. The very next sentence. The author sets it up. He said, let's go live there. He died. And she's left with sick and tired. <laughs> very next sentence. Here's what we read. Sick and tired. Married Moabite women. They should have never married Moabite women. They were enemies. They were unbelievers. They should have never married. Now, we don't know why they married. We don't know. We don't know if Malon and Kilion, they were at the local Moabite bar, and they're like, man, you see the neck on that woman? Woo! <laughs> and then, you know, then, then Rue's sitting there, and, you know, Kilion's talking to her, and, and he's just thinking, man, she is a really nice friend. She's listening to all my problems, and we don't know how they got married. They should have never married, but they married the very next sentence. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died. So it does seem that we're seeing this principle even here in Ruth. If you live inside of God's house, you're protected. You live outside of God's house and you're vulnerable, you're exposed. Let me, let me give you a, an image. God has a house. That's, this, that's his covenant. So again, the, the, the house is the covenant and the covenant that we are in as the people of God is in the covenant that Jesus made available by his death and his resurrection. We are now part of God's house and we are protected as long as we live under God's rule and his reign, his values, his standards, his holiness. As long as we live in his house, we don't have to worry about his discipline. But when we want to wander away from God's house and begin to go against his rule and reign, we are exposed, we are vulnerable to his discipline. That should be the way it is in a Christian household. As long as our children obey our rule and reign as we parent them under the authority of the Lord, man, they're going to enjoy life in the house. But if they start rejecting and rebelling against our rule and reign and ultimately against God's rule and reign, there should be punishments. There should be consequences. Well, I don't like the way they act when I punish them and take away their PlayStation. It ought to hurt. Because this is, this is the principle that we're learning here. If God's people live under his rule and reign, they're going to enjoy life to its fullest, even if you don't have a lot. But you get outside discipline. And here's the thing, God does not discipline out of hate or vindictiveness. He disciplines out of love because he wants us to come back to the house. Ah, gosh, I wanna keep saying things, but I gotta keep moving on, I gotta keep moving on. Do you see this principle play out, Josh, in the scriptures? Yeah, I actually, not only do we see it with Israel, not only are we seeing it with Elimelech and his boys, but we see it with Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 10, they offered unauthorized fire. God struck them dead. Achan in Joshua 7 stole from the Lord. They had a victory. And instead of giving all of the, the bounty to, to the Lord, Achan stole some for himself, put it in his tent, and then it was revealed. And so he lost his life as well as his entire family. Samson revealed his secret because he was playing with fire. That fire was called Delilah, by the way. He lost his strength. King Saul took matters into his own hand. First king of Israel took matters into his own hands and he performed a ritual he had no business performing. God took the throne from him. David committed murder and adultery, tried to hide both of them up and eventually he's going to lose his son Jonah ran away. God said, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach repentance. Jonah's like, I ain't. I'm getting a boat and getting a cruise ship. I'm going the opposite way. God sends a storm and a big fish to get him to come back. Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter five lied to the Lord. God strikes them dead. Uh, Paul writes this in 
Corinthians, that many Corinthians became sick, some of them even died because they partook of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. In other words, they were living like pagan Gentiles and still trying to claim the blood of Jesus on their life and God calls sickness and even death in some of them. So yes, when God's people go outside of his house and do right what is in their own eyes, God disciplines his people. Are y'all okay? Okay, all right. Just making sure, gotta make sure. But hear this, please hear this. We need to remember the Christian life isn't about perfection. It's not even about pursuing perfection. The Christian life is about a fertile heart and pursuing Jesus. See, what what Elimelech and what Israel show us in the Old Testament is when you have a spirit of stubbornness, when you are habitually sinning, that's when, it's not because you, you, you sin today and you, you made a mistake or you, you got mad and you yelled and you normally, die. that's not when God's issuing the discipline. It's the habitual, stubborn, prideful heart. And what he's trying to do with discipline is soften the heart so that you can come back to him. See, Elimelech purposefully lived outside the covenantal boundaries, not only spiritually, but geographically. And uh, I really wish David was around during this point, but he's not around because he hadn't been born yet. But here's what David writes in Psalm 37. The blameless spend their days under the Lord's care and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. Like, like those who, like, Lord, you're enough. So, so here's my encouragement, stay in the Lord. Well, so Naomi finds herself in a state of grief, living in a foreign land with no family or friends except her two daughters-in-law. She truly has lost everything. And it does seem like the name of Elimelech will be blotted out of Israel for all time because there's no man to carry on the name. And so here's what Naomi says when she had lost everything. Here's what she says. Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Um, Maybe you can identify with Naomi today and you have experienced some devastating losses. And as a result, maybe you're upset at God. Maybe you're spiritually lethargic. There's no joy, no hope in your life, no purpose. You think your life is over. You think God has abandoned you. You think God isn't for you. You you think God doesn't care about you. Just, Just hold on to point number two here in just a second though. But maybe you identify with Naomi. Um, Here's the principle. I'm drilling down on this principle. Running away from God will make you bitter, not better. I'm drilling down on that because I want you to know it because I do think that there are a lot of people, a lot of Christians today in the 21st century, they are running away from God and their life is bitter, not better. But uh, all right, so now we have entered into the darkness of Ruth 1. You ready for, you ready for some gospel light? Oh, I'm ready, I'm ready. All right, here we go, number two. God will show up in your bitterness and he will begin showing you he's better. So you might, you might be Naomi. You might be bitter. You might not have no joy. You might not have any purpose. You might think God has abandoned you all, but God's gonna show up in your bitterness. Just hold on. But God does something gracious, amazing in the story. Now, while he's certainly going to target Naomi because she's left, and he's going to begin to display unbelievable kindness and compassion, uh, He's going to do so also with Elimelech. Let me, let me give you my sanctified imagination. Now, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna, in some sense, read into the text what's not there, but I, I'm, I'm gonna be on firm footing and, and, and you'll see why. So Elimelech dies. And then 10 years later, his boys die. Now, I could imagine Elimelech in heaven with the Lord and the uh, Lord's like, You know why I brought you here, don't you? Yeah, I took matters into my own hands. Um, Yeah, it looks like I really messed up because here's Malon and Kilion and they're here and there's no male to carry on my name. And I could imagine 
this conversation happening in heaven and, uh, and God's like, I ain't done yet. Watch this, Elimelech. Because I'm about to redeem your name. Come in here for this, church. Because maybe some of you, you identify with Elimelech. You've experienced the discipline of the Lord and you have experienced devastating consequences because of your sin. I want you to know that we serve a kind, gracious, and compassionate God who can redeem you from the disaster you made. Even though you have burned something down, God can rebuild it up. Even if you're dead. That's what's happened with Elimelech. He's dead. He ain't coming back to planet Earth, but God is going to continue the name and the family lineage of Elimelech. So he's going to do so by showing up and showing Naomi that he's better. And here's how he's going to do it, four ways. Uh, She still has her health. She hears her land has produced fruit, food. God's not forgotten them. She experiences the Lord kindness through Ruth and she returns during the beginning of the barley harvest. That's gonna be important next message. So she has her personal health, provisional supplies are being made for the family. She does have a a family member that's going to stick with her. We'll see here in a second. And the timing is just right. Now, so Naomi, she's packing her things. She's getting ready to return home. Her daughters-in-law want to go with her, but she begins to think about it. And there's actually three strikes against her daughter-in-laws. One, they're widows. Two, they're Moabites. Three, they're with Naomi, who's lost everything. So that, those are three strikes. And Naomi's beginning to think about, all right, this isn't the best thing for them to come back with me. So she says, listen, ladies, like, I love you. Thank you so much for showing love to my boys and to me. But here's the thing. You just need to go back home, find some nice Moabite men, settle down, have a family, and live happily ever after. Well, at first, both of them are like, no, Naomi, we, we actually love you. You are a really good mother-in-law. We hear, we hear stories about other Moabite mother-in-laws. Like, no, no, you're really good. We would, we would love to stay with you. And Naomi's like, come on, girls, please. Listen, my life is bitter. It seems like God's hand is against me. Listen, if you just follow me, you don't have a future. Stay here where you have a future. So it's at this point, Orpah is like, you know what? I've always wanted to pursue a career in being a talk show host and giving away camels. No lie, Oprah, her birth certificate is actually Orpah. That's what her parents named her, but they kept on getting it wrong. So that's why I went there with that. So so Orpah's like, yeah, I'll just go back. But Ruth, the Bible says she clung to Naomi. That word clung is the same word we see in Genesis 2, 24, where a man will leave his father and mother and cling fast to his wife. So she clings to Naomi and here's what Ruth says. She utters this confession. Don't urge me to leave you, Naomi, or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. There's this, there's this profound confession. This is her confession in Yahweh. This is where she transitions from an unbeliever to a believer. Now, let me just drill down on this confession in three ways real quick. Just give it to you in passing. But, but, but how did Ruth get to this point? The beautiful kindness of Naomi, even in bitterness, probably prompted her conversion. Because Naomi is constantly speaking blessing over Orpah and Ruth. Naomi is showing kindness and compassion to Orpah. Orpah and Ruth, even in her bitterness, even in her suffering. And Ruth is seeing the compassion and the graciousness of her faith, of her God, demonstrated through her. It it reminds me of what the apostle Paul says later on, is that it's the kindness of God that leads us to what? 
repentance. See, this is why, hey church, I'm, I'll never grow tired of telling you this. It's how we suffer as believers that is going to be a missional tool to, de- to declare God's glory, to declare God's kindness among the nations of how we deal with suffering. Because even in her bitterness, she is displaying the substance of her faith in Yahweh that he truly is at the core, kind and compassionate too. The sacrificial death of her conversion. Ruth says, you know what? I'm, I'm turning my back on my homeland. I'm turning my back on my family. I'm turning my back on my gods. And you now will be my family. Your homeland will be my homeland and your God will be my God. Is that not what Jesus told us to do is to pick up your cross and follow me? So basically what he's saying is that you die so that I can live. So, so that's what she's doing. And then the third thing that we see is that the demonstration of the loyal love of God in her conversion. Oh, I love this. I love this. So where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your family will be my family. Your nation will be my nation. Your friends will be my friends. Your God will be my God. Where you'll be buried, I'll be buried. Now, now keep in mind, she's going through her own loss, her own grief. She had lost her husband. She's childless. She's still in a vulnerable, not ideal situation. If she goes with Naomi, she probably doesn't have a future, yet she still demonstrates the loyal love of God. What does her name mean? Friend. Ruth is embodying the friendship of God. I want you to know God will never leave you or forsake you, regardless of what season you are in. Our God, he clings to you when you feel like you have nothing to cling to. Our God enters your bitterness, regardless of how bitter, regardless of how upset you are, he enters into your bitterness without himself becoming bitter. He will stick with you to the very end because our God, he is a covenant loyal God. Oh, he's not just your king. He's not just your savior, but he's your friend who sticks closer than a brother. And he's working in your bitterness. Whether it's from discipline or living in a fallen world, that very breath that we just took, that's God's goodness. Your health, God's goodness. Your sane mind, God's goodness. Your job, God's goodness. Your skills, abilities, talents, God's goodness. The water that you get to drink, God's goodness. Food on your table, God's goodness. Money to buy the necessities, God's goodness. Even when you ain't got money, but there is a food bank, that food bank is God's goodness. If you got a home and a shelter, that is God's goodness. If you drove a car here, that's God's goodness. Well, you don't know what kind of car it is. I didn't even think it was gonna start. Did it start, did it get here? God's goodness. You got a family that sticks with you, God's goodness. You got, you got friends that stick with you, God's goodness. You, I, here's what I want you to know. You got a church that cares for you, that wants to pray for you, that wants to serve you. Listen, that's God's goodness. Those little yet subtle messages that's embedded in the radio, the billboard, the memo, the devotional, God's goodness goodness unprompted gifts like a thank you here like i'm praying for you there god's goodness god's goodness comes in so many ways it can come in subtle winks it can come in the still small faint voice it can come in a loud thunder or a wrecking ball but will you position yourself your eyes to see god's goodness because naomi isn't at a point where she can fully see god's goodness let me put up what she said again don't call me naomi call me mara The Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back. What? What what, the Lord brought her back? What? This is what's so so fascinating is that the next verse, the author tells us that Naomi left Moab, returned to her homeland with Ruth. She didn't come back empty. She, She didn't come back empty. Like if I was Ruth, if I was Ruth, I'd be like, woman, I thought you were a good mother-in-law. I just gave you this, I, come on, what? I know that's a little squeaky, I understand. <laughs> come, in, come, come in for this. You might identify with Ruth. You're going through a very difficult, dry, barren season. 
and you don't feel seen, you don't feel heard, you don't feel acknowledged, you don't feel loved, you don't feel like you have a future, you don't feel like anyone wants you. I'm here to tell you, God sees you in the background. God says, I, I hear you, I acknowledge you, I want you, I love you. Just wait, Ruth, just wait. I'm doing something for you too. I'm doing something for you. You got a future with me now. So uh, here's my takeaways from Naomi though. Here's my takeaways. Don't let your bitterness blind you from seeing God's goodness. And then don't let your bitter trial turn you into a bad theologian. She thought God was doing that to her because God didn't care. No, God cares. Don't become a bad theologian in your bitter trial. And then don't let your bitterness in life keep you from realizing that the Lord is better than life. Because even in our bitter seasons, we can cling to the truth that we have a better who? Savior. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that our people, that your people, they will come to realize that even in the bitterness, you're better. So I pray for my brothers and sisters, some who might identify with Ruth today, Elimelech, or even Naomi, (laughs) that you will encourage them that you're not done working in their life, that you are behind the scenes in your sovereign, providential way, working good. Spirit of God, I pray that you would give us the patience, that you will give us the endurance, the perseverance to wait for you to move and to work in a miraculous, supernatural way as we cling to the truth that you truly are a better Savior. Amen.